Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, this is a public workshop to discuss wildfire strategies. Um, this workshop was initiated as a result of the town's uh, climate adaptation plan, um, but really the town is, is kind of one of several stakeholders in the overall discussion relating to wildfire. And as a result, um, you know, we, we partnered up with Central Marin Fire and pg &E to really have a, a more comprehensive discussion. Um, before we start the presentation, I'd like to introduce some of the presenters. And so RJ Suko, Director of Public Works for the Town of Puerto Madera, and I'm going to use my screen. And uh, Todd, if you don't mind uh, introducing yourself, Todd Lando. Hey, I'm Todd Lando with Central Marin Fire Department. I, I'm a wildfire hazard mitigation specialist. Great. Sasha Peterson. Good evening, everybody. Sasha Peterson, Director of Adaptation International, partnering with the town on the adaptation plan. Uh, Todd Cusimano. Hey, I'm Todd Cusimano. I'm your town manager. Ruben Martin. Ruben Martin, Fire Chief, Central Marine Fire Department. And Adam Wolf. Hi, all. Adam Wolf, uh, your planning and building director. So, we want to spend uh, the bulk of this evening um, really providing additional clarity, answering any questions. Um, I'd also like to add that we received a, a ton of great comments. Um, recently and that we do um, take those to heart and we will be uh, diving those into detail and revising the document accordingly. And so that's work that's still to come, but definitely want to hear from you more tonight and uh, really um, discuss what's on your mind and get to some of these issues. And uh, with that, I'll pass it over to Sasha Peterson with Adaptation International to start with an, an overview of kind of the climate adaptation plan as a process as a whole. And um, he'll then pass it over to um, Central Marine Fire to kind of talk about their initiatives and, and kind of some of the things they, they view that are important to the conversation. Thank you, go ahead, Sasha. Great, thank you, RJ, and thanks everybody for joining. Just a quick reminder, this webinar will be recorded. So if you wanna share it with your friends and neighbors or if you got joined just a little bit late, it will be available after it gets processed, but we're glad you're here for this conversation. Um, the ADA, just to orient you, I'm sure you've been on more than 100 Zoom meetings between this, you know, this time last year and now, so probably very familiar with it. But there's going to be a couple of different ways for you to provide comments and input over the course of the evening. Um, you can see at the bottom of your screen, there's a raise hand option. So after our introductions and a little bit of framing on where we are in the planning process and some of the work that Central Marine Fire is doing, We'll have a discussion period, and if you raise your hand, if you want to, you know, speak and add your comments, thoughts, and input, then it'll queue up, and Rebecca will help organize that and unmute you, so you can speak. Once you're unmuted, you will have to unmute yourself in order to be able to talk. There's also a Q and A button at the bottom there, and you can use that at any time during the conversation. If you have thoughts and ideas, you can type them in there, and we will capture those also um, over the course of the conversation and bring those into the mix. Our agenda for the evening is this short welcome period and then that brief framing um, both on the adaptation plan and some of the town's wildfire mitigation efforts. And then really the bulk of the conversation will be focused on discussion. And then we'll have a little time to wrap up at the end. So as a catch up, if you haven't been involved in the adaptation planning process, this is, as RJ mentioned, a Caltrans adaptation planning grant. The town has been working collaboratively on better understanding some of the climate and extreme weather related risks for the community over the last two years and developing a roadmap, a suite of adaptation actions that the town can choose from in the future to reduce those risks and enhance resilience. Um, I'm not going to go into this, but we all know one of the amazing characteristics of Corte Madera are the hillside communities that do, you know, have wildfire risk and Central Marin Fire can speak to that more as we go through. As I mentioned, the plan itself really is a roadmap for actions. Um, this graphic here is from the California Adaptation Planning Guide, and it describes the whole process of working to develop an adaptation plan and implement actions to build resilience. The first two phases have, some of that work has already been done. 
throughout the county over the last number of years. This project built on that, sort of did some customized and localized vulnerability assessments for the end of phase two, and then is really focused on phase three and defining the adaptation actions that are most suitable, effective, efficient, and feasible for the community. Um, once the plan is solidified, it really becomes a library of choices that the town can use. You know, it may augment efforts that are already being worked on, or it may add a few new strategies and actions to the mix. Um, but once those, you know, once that library is said, it's up to the community and the town leadership to pick which books to read from that library and implementing those actions will have their own implementation process. Um, the plan itself was developed over the course of the last two years and had these five major phases. If you wanna look back in any of the workshops and input that's happened, all of that is on the cordamaderaadapts.org website. So there was community engagement back at the very beginning of the project and we had a workshop focused on hillside risks and concerns. Um, there was working with a technical advisory group over the course of a couple of years that involved some neighborhood representatives as well as agencies. Um, some workshops, unfortunately virtual. We wish we could be holding this workshop and discussion in person, but we're doing the best we can given the limitations with COVID. Um, there was refinement after those workshops and then a discussion at the end of November to share the draft plan, which many of you have read, and then this continued conversation to help refine and customize the adaptation roadmap. Well, lastly, before I hand it over to Central Marin Fire, just wanna highlight here that these first, you know, three, four pink boxes there are really, you know, aspects of the project that have been completed. And we're here in the community conversation to refine the draft and improve it. And um, even after the adoption of that plan, that for any of the larger projects, there are a number of additional steps that need to happen to, you know, better understand, analyze, think about the cost implications of implementing actions and then actually going through the process of implementing those actions. Some actions may be easier, some actions may be more involved, but there'd be a number of steps and adopting this roadmap and setting that strategy and that group of ideas does not commit the town to implementing any one of those specific actions that's highlighted in the plan. So happy to talk about that more during the discussion. I guess the last thing I'll leave you with is the community's goals for this planning process is really to address the climate challenge. The town of Corte Madera is a leader in the region in really recognizing and identifying and responding to the risks of climate change and has the vision of building one town, one region, resilient together. Under that, there are four key goals for this plan and probably one that we'll spend some time talking about today is the first goal of really protecting the health, safety, and well-being of the town residents, visitors, and workers by getting ahead of the curve and focusing on preparedness and prevention. But the other goals of incorporating resilience and equity into town's plans, policies, and projects, increasing awareness, and thinking about the urgency of adapting to climate change and preparing for climate change and bringing all of us together to pick the right actions to take in that process are all goals for this plan. So with that, I'll turn it over to Todd. If you wanna focus us in more on the hillside and the wildfire risk for that portion of town. Before we get to Todd, I, I wanna go ahead and get started and kind of thank everyone for joining us today. Um, and just to kind of reiterate that we understand the hazards that exist within living in a hillside community. Um, we've understand, understood that for several years. Um, and then 2017 fires really brought that to light um, with the major catastrophic wildfires. And since 2017, we've been doing a lot um, within Central Marin, which includes Corvidere and Larkspur, on trying to figure out some best practices for reducing some of these hazards that are there. Um, some of them has been fuels reduction, chipper programs, defensible space inspections, as you guys know. But with the uh, passage of Measure C, that was a big um, boost in the arm of the fire department. Prior to the passage of Measure C, the fire department never had any funding or wasn't intended to do fuels reduction projects. But we understood as both Marin emergency managers and as residents that this is a priority for us. And so what does Measure C do for us as a community? 
It provides $20 million of a continuous funding source over the next 10 years to do several different mitigation factors, which include fuels reduction projects, um, defensible space inspections, home hardening inspections, trying to educate um, our community members, because uh, we understand that the anxiety level is at an ultimate high and your risk level is, is lower than where your anxiety level is. And what we're trying to do is educate and inform you on what those hazards are and what we're doing as a community to reduce those hazards. And we've got a multi-prong approach and there is no one silver bullet out there that's gonna completely eliminate your risk to zero, even though we'd like to, unless we completely pave over the entire town. Um, and that's probably not gonna happen. Um, so with that, that's kind of the premise. Um, I'll turn it over to Todd Lando, which we were fortunate enough to um, hire and acquire here within Central Marin. Todd is one of the, I guess, both local and regional and statewide um, experts on defensible space and hazard mitigation. Um, we were able to snag him away from FireSafe Marin, and he is now dedicated to trying to figure out different strategies to be able to reduce uh, the wildfire risk within the community of Corte Madero. Thanks, Chief. Uh, thanks everyone for being here. Uh, 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 I'll start off, I've got this slide you've been looking at. Now, just a reminder for folks, or maybe you haven't seen this term before, WUI, that, uh, we pronounce that WUI. Um, and we're referring to the wildland urban interface, that area where homes meet wild lands where, where wildfires occur. So I'm gonna uh, uh, address this tonight from the perspective of, of the discussions that we know have been happening in, in the community. Uh, specifically in the Christmas Tree Hill neighborhood, or probably prominently there, I'm sure they're happening elsewhere, about the, uh, the, the potential for uh, risk mitigation, wildfire mitigation by undergrounding power lines. And, and we've followed along with those discussions. We've had some, some contact with, uh, with folks in the community, and we felt that the fire department's perspective uh, was probably not well understood. And, and uh, some of the science and background that we're working from was not well understood in the community. So I'm gonna give you a real simple overview of what, what our perspective is as it relates specifically to power lines uh, and the potential for undergrounding power lines and how that may or may not affect your risk uh, based on the neighborhood you live in. I uh, just quickly want to want to make sure that we understand three different concepts of fire that I'm going to talk about. I'll bring them all together here, but but uh, we look at wildfires, vegetation fires. These are fires that are burning exclusively in wild areas, uh, open space, parklands, um, uh, the Mount Tam watershed. The, when vegetation is burning, we're going to call this a wildfire. Um, I, here, there's a photo of a fire burned recently in Marin. Small fire, just like the ones your fire department is eminently capable of putting out. We have, uh, the, there's that term again, WUI. We have wildland urban interface fires. This, uh, this photograph is from the, the Oakland Hills fire that many of you probably remember. It was uh, the start of what is now, uh, we recognize as a modern trend in wildfires. It happened about 10 miles from where most of you are sitting burned 3,000 homes, killed 25 people. Um, and, and if you, you look at this photograph, you're gonna see what uh, it looks like a really recognizable neighborhood. Um, it, you know, in a lot of ways, this could be where you live. We understand that. We've seen more recently, just in the last five years, is this trend towards urban wildfires or urban fires, where these are conflagrations that occur in communities that actually are not adjacent to uh, what those wild areas. These are wildfires. They start as wildfires, but they spread to communities. They spread to the built environment and essentially burn home to home. The vegetation is really not a factor at all in this type of fire. Um, uh, and, and this image in particular is one that you've probably seen. Uh, I know this causes a lot of anxiety in the community. It's, it does among the fire service. This is Coffee Park in Santa Rosa, where about 1500 homes burned in just a matter of hours, uh, miles and miles from the closest vegetation. <clears throat> I'm going to show you this and then hopefully bring us back to that discussion of the different types of fires. When we look at the different fires, every fire has its origin. Every fire starts somehow. It's got a cause. 
And, and it's important for the fire service so, uh, to understand the, the risks surrounding different causes, to understand what the most common and most likely causes of wildfires are. And we know that discussions about uh, electrical utilities have dominated the conversation since 2017. We understand we were there when the North Bay fires started and all of the North Bay fires started under extreme wind conditions and they started from down power lines. Uh, but overall, when we look at wildfires in California, the damage caused by them, we need to look at the big picture. And, and from the fire services perspective, we understand that those electrical utilities, power lines themselves, start about 8% of the wildfires in California. That tells us that 92% of California's wildfires did not start from those utilities. So uh, if it seems to you like we're putting a, an undue amount of attention onto all of these other factors and not focused on the one that's causing you the most concern, those power lines, it's based on some science. It's based on an understanding of what's actually happening out there. We have, uh, we have to focus on the more likely causes and it's these other 92% that dominate wildfire ignitions in California. That's not to say we're not concerned about the electrical utilities. We're very concerned about the, those utilities. And we feel that uh, there are measures that can be taken to mitigate that 8% of fires that start from them. So to bring it back together and to help you understand why I talked about wildfires and urban fires, I want to just show you this quick picture. This is a map. This is the campfire that started near Paradise in 2018. Uh, it started near the town of Paradise. Paradise was destroyed. The photographs you saw were from Paradise. But the reality was it started in a, in a wild area in the National Forest, about a 45 minute drive away from the town of Paradise. This is the common denominator among all of these, these urban conflagrations that, that ignite from the downed power lines. And I don't think this is well understood. These fires start far from the communities that they eventually burn. In fact, in none of the cases that we're aware of where, the, where uh, there was significant damage to a community, in none of those cases did the power lines come down within the community. The power lines come down in each case, uh, they come down uh, uh, upwind for, from the community. The wind drives a wildfire that starts, the fire builds. In this case, the fire was almost 50,000 acres by the time it struck the community. It was famously burning a football field a second. Um, th those are all real factors, but it's very different than the concern about power lines that are in your front yard starting a fire. We understand that this is a significant risk, and this is one of the reasons you're going to hear from the fire service that we're actually more concerned about the power lines that are far from your community than we are about the ones that are right in your front yard. Again, well, I'm not negating some risk. But I'm saying that when we focus on the most likely ignition sources, we're looking farther from your homes than you might imagine. Uh, for a good example we've used is that the, the uh, power lines up on Mount Tamil Pius, uh, other types of ignitions that might start a fire somewhere uh, to the north or east of your community are really the ones that we're most concerned about. We have a good understanding of the science behind fires. We have a, a fantastic grasp on the, the risks and hazards of wildfires in Marin. The Community Wildfire Protection Plan, if you're not familiar with it, is a document you should take a look at. It's been updated just in the last month with a, a, a state-of-the-art uh, tool that will allow you to peruse the data that we've collected, the wildfire modeling that we've used to understand our risk and our hazard in Marin. Uh, it's available at firesafemarin.org slash CWPP. And this is really where we look. We're, we're, not, we're, we're filtering through our anxiety. We're, we're looking at the facts, the numbers, data to support our conclusions and looking at the places where the mitigation measures that we're gonna be undertaking with that measure C, the Marin Wildfire Pre Prevention Authority, we're looking at the places where we'll do the most good, make the most impact and best protect your neighborhoods. That focuses right back to your homes. Uh, and I'm gonna wrap up here with a quick discussion and a reminder that the things that we're concerned about uh, are, are really very simple. Regardless of what starts a wildfire, what, when that fire hits your neighborhood, when it impacts your community, your risk comes from millions and millions of tiny embers that can land in your front yard. And there are a huge number of actions that you can take, many of them free or very inexpensive, 
uh, to mitigate your risk from those embers. Uh, we need to get back to basics. We need to look at, at this from what we call a house out approach. We need to start right at the skin of your house and work our way out because regardless of the measures that we take to uh, mitigate ignition sources, wildfires are going to occur. The best way we can mitigate the damage in your neighborhood and protect your lives and your property is to focus on the home itself, the landscaping around the home through home hardening and defensible space. Back to basics, a real simple approach that has a huge impact on communities when they undertake these actions. Um, this is that house out approach. This is, uh, this is some of the science that we base our, our uh, um, recommendations on where we've looked at, at how homes ignite during wildfires. I'm not gonna go into any of the details tonight unless there's a specific question that, uh, that we can answer. But uh, I, I want you to know that there's a huge amount of information available from your fire department. You can reach out to me uh, at any time. Fire Safe Marin is a, our nonprofit organization provides a ton of education materials, and I'm happy to deliver this information to you if you want help mitigating the risk in your own front yard. But that house out approach, when we start at the home, we, we do home hardening, and then we extend ourselves into the community, looking at defensible space in this critical area, the first five feet around homes. Uh, we call this zone zero. It's an area that we need to be absolutely resistant to embers. And it may seem counterintuitive when you're fearful of, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, ignition of a fire from power lines on your hillside or all the other risk factors that you may be confronted with. But these are simple mitigation measures that will make a huge difference for you and can potentially save your home lives. And if the whole community undertakes them, we can mitigate the risk significantly for everybody up there. Um, with, with that, I, we're going to, I think, take a, a couple minutes of questions. Am I, am I correct, uh, RJ, right here, and then uh, transition into a conversation? Yeah. Um, yeah. Once, if you're down through presentation, Sasha is going to lead a, an exercise to um, take some questions. We'll do some responses, and we'll kind of repeat that cycle and do a few rounds until um, we either have no questions or we run out of time. Yeah, that sounds great. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you, Todd. Thank you, RJ. Uh, Kismano, yeah, would you like to say something? Yeah, yeah I'm sorry. Just a real, um, I, I want to take credit for hiring Ruben Martin as our chief and Todd Lando as our, as, as our specialist. Um, you know, the, the other uh, manager in Larkspur and I, when we step back and we we you know we were able to form Central Marin Fire Authority, this is this was at the top of the list of we need to bring in experts and specialists in this area to really be the to lead this charge moving forward. And as you can see, these two gentlemen um, are at the they're at, they're at the top of the sphere. They every you know everyone in this county in this region we rely on the two of them, and they're outstanding. And I just want to give both of you credit for being here. Thank you for keeping us safe. And I also want to give, you know, this before we start the conversation, I want to give some credit to some residents uh, that are on this call that have engaged us, you know, through this process and really helped educate staff a little bit, helped us find a way to help both the town and the residents problem solve issues moving forward. And so, you know, we're going to talk about, you know, fire mitigation and, and, and risk, as Todd Lando just stated. But one of the conversation pieces regarding uh, undergrounding, we're gonna have uh, two representatives from pg &E on the call a little bit later, Jim Wickham and Mark Van Gorder. Um, but really, you know, when you look at page 113, I believe of the paragraph on page 113 regarding undergrounding, one of the things that the town is gonna bring to the council in March, and it's really um, at the urging and, and really the problem solving work with some people on this call, and I, I just want to give them credit. It's Matthew Kaufman, Anita Block, Steve Kaplan, Steve Silver, Sasha Popko, um, Mark Levy, Gene Burns, and Colin and Kevin Woodall. Um, you know, they they referenced a, a study by Harrison Associates. Uh, the city of Berkeley did it, uh, and it was a undergrounding study, uh, a baseline study to for the development of utility undergrounding, um, a utility undergrounding program, and what. After some discussions, what we're going to take to council for consideration, and then what we'll do is we'll link it to that paragraph on page 13 of this document. Um, and really what we'll do is we'll take the WUI area, the, the wildland urban interface, as Todd Lando talked about, and we'll look at the three communities in our high-risk fire areas, Christmas Tree Hill, Chapman Hill, and Granada Hill. 
And then we'll look at funding sources and opportunities for us, areas where we can partner with our, um, with our neighbors. Um, we'll look at cost estimates. And you know, we'll also look at possible projects of maybe looking at undergrounding specific areas, potentially on evacuation zones. Um, and so there's a, there's a whole bunch of information that we really need to study. Uh, the town agrees with the neighbors that we should, so we can start a conversation and understand, you know, based on facts of what we're talking about. And then what we can do is we can overlay that conversation with our fire specialist, understanding our resources over the next 10 to 15 years, and what is the best way to utilize our resources. And as you see, we have two specialists on this call right now, and we're going to lean on them heavy. But we think this is an important piece of information we should have so we can have a dialogue. Again, pg e will be on the call in the second half of this call, uh, and they'll be available to us to also share with us the things that they're doing uh, and answer any questions, and really in collaboration down the road with what that study you know, tells us and brings us to in discussion. So I just wanted to give credit to the residents. I wanted everyone to know that we've heard you, and you know, we think there's a little bit more information to get. Um, so we can we can talk about facts. And so uh, thanks again for that. And I'll turn it back over to you, Sasha. Hey, real quick, Sasha. Um, I see we have uh, about 60 participants. If people can start raising their hand who would like to comment, that'll give us a sense of how much time to dedicate. Um, Yeah, so I think, RJ, we were thinking about if you want to speak, you definitely raise your hand and you'll be, you have an opportunity to do that. If there are a lot of people that would like to speak, then we'll probably do a couple rounds just so we can capture some comments and talk about them and then, you know, capture some more comments and talk about them. If you don't want to speak, feel free to type questions or comments or ideas into the question and answer box. There is a cool feature where if someone shares an idea that you agree in, you can use your little thumbs up button to kind of add weight to that and bump it up the list um, without having to retype the same. You can also comment on people's comments so that you can add your voices there. Um, it looks like, Rebecca, right, we have maybe five people who'd like to start off with conversations. And so maybe we do those first and then we have a- Yes, I'm seeing question. five raised hands so far. Um, how many minutes are we doing two? Yeah, we'll start with two and, and if we can always do multiple rounds and um, open it up later if we have um, more time. Okay. Well, so we have about six. Uh, the first person I will unmute will be Matt Kaufman. Matt, are you able to unmute yourself? Can you hear me? I can now. Okay, okay thank you. Uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Matt Kaufman. I live on Christmas Tree Hill. Thank you for organizing this workshop. We really, truly appreciate it. Uh, once we became aware of the draft climate adaptation plan, we quickly organized an underground advocacy committee. And I will put our website in the chat later for other residents to reference. But a few things struck us about the draft climate adaptation plan that I want to discuss. And there's two primarily. The first is equity. There is not equity in the current climate adaptation plan. As it relates to sea level rise and wildfires, which are both very important climate change issues for our town, they are not reflected equally in the document. And the front page says it all. It's a picture of flooding. The scope and description of imminent risk of fire to our community is severely lacking. We strongly believe that fire is an imminent issue that must be addressed today. We believe flooding is a 20 year or more issue. The second is, there's a lack of focus on prevention. Mitigation stops the effects of the fire once it starts. Prevention stops the fire from starting in the first place. Both are important, and we know that an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure in both cases. But we need to stop fires where they start. And we know that some of the most devastating wildfires in California, 8% apparently, are caused by above ground power lines. Simply put, from, our risk, from a risk perspective, the fewer wires we have in our community, the fewer fires we're gonna have. So our undergrounding advocacy committee is requesting the following three things of staff. The first is the equity issue must be solved. There must be true parity between fire and flooding addressed in the plan. And this includes expansion of the draft climate adaptation plan to include true fire prevention strategies, not simply listing out things that are already occurring from a mitigation perspective. The second is a full comprehensive study 
done by an independent third-party expert that Todd that we've talked about to conduct a full analysis related to undergrounding in Corte Madera. We believe that this study should focus on the highest risk areas, the so-called WUI areas. And we're that happy- time has expired. Matt, do you want to just mention your third thing? Yeah, can we quickly? just Matt finish that point, the third point? The last is, and Todd, you've already mentioned it, that the CAP language surrounding undergrounding really needs to reflect and reference this study and have actionable language to proceed forward with implementation of undergrounding. We look forward to continuing the discussion with the town. Thank you. All right, thank you for those comments, Matt. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, attendee to speak will be Alexander Popko. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having us all tonight. Um, I have a comment followed by a, a question. Um, the presentation that our fire experts have uh, demonstrated to us today leans heavily on the data when it comes to making decisions. Um, but it seems to me that the data that is being presented, including the 8%, is too broad in that it covers the entire California, is not necessarily contextual to our specific area. Uh, each community is unique and the ignition sources and their probability would differ given its specificity. So um, the question that follows then, when it comes to rating, available options, uh, variables and invariants when it comes to understanding what would maximize the safety, what exactly are those grading criteria, and how are they being specific to our uh, neighborhood or our particular hillside? And how does that reflect the probability and the percentages? Thank you, that's my question. Did we address the, that question right now, or? Um, Let's do a couple more, and then we'll we'll bring it back. Okay. Okay. The next attendee with a raised hand is Maureen O'Rourke. Maureen, can you unmute yourself? Hello, Maureen O'Rourke, three three two Redwood Avenue, on Christmas Street Hill at the bottom. Um, again, thanks for doing this. Todd knows we've long waited this occasion. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the other benefits to undergrounding in addition to our most serious one, of course, is fire prevention, but also um, to benefit the town and the residents, um, undergrounding PG&E wires will eliminate our, the PG&E outages in the future for us. And that's going to be, a, I think, a growing factor for all of our area here as you know, our conditions remain the same. And also in the future, I think we're going to have a, a growing need for reliable electricity because I think people are gonna still continue to work from home. But additionally, I think we're all going to be charging our electric cars at our home in the future because as of 2035, all cars in California sold are going to have to be electric cars. So there's another factor to be balanced in terms of the overall issue of undergrounding um, in Corte Madera. Of course, the unknown is how to pay for it. And we're really hoping that Todd and the gang and the contractor will really put their thinking caps on and come up with some innovative thinking um, about how we can really make this happen. But also in addition, when you're doing this study, in addition to the direct cost, um, I'm hoping you'll consider long-term savings and benefits that might offset expenditures. And I think you'll find some of those in the uh, Glass report that we sent um, from the Professor Glass from Rutgers. And that includes the um, savings from tree trim, annual serious tree trimming. Um, also firefighter liabilities that are reduced and what the impact is on firefighters who aren't gonna to have to deal with downed wires, which I think are a very serious concern. Maintaining our home values, 
when we're a little bit of a lower risk, um, fire liabilities for the mall, because if the fire starts here, what's happening with the mall? Um, and time expired. Okay, that's it. Thank you, Maureen. RJ, do you want to do one more and then yeah, it's pause? One more and then we'll bring it back for a response. Okay, the next uh, attendee with a raised hand is Keith Axtell. Yes, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for conducting this opportunity to understand what's happening in our community. I'm one of the leaders of our neighborhood response group in uh, Chapman Park. And last year, uh, we conducted a cleanup day in the neighborhood and were quite successful. But we also find that we have some very frustrated neighbors here because the people next door have large stands of bamboo, uh, juniper, or other dangerous plants that are threatening their home and their properties. Uh, uh, we understand that the city of San Rafael just passed an ordinance to start requiring people to mitigate these kind of hazards. And I want, uh, would like to know whether uh, Corte Madera is gonna put some teeth in our guidance and start enfor enforcing some good sense uh, requirements to uh, eliminate some of these hazards for our neighborhood. Great, thank you, Keith. Um, so Todd and Ruben, it looks like, you know, we're having some, if you can see the screen share where, you know, there's some grouping of issues that's emerging. And, you know, definitely one of them is, you know, there's been a few questions on the ignition sources piece, you know, whether the data is localized enough. There was a question in the chat, um, question and answer sections about data that you showed in the graph was from, you know, 2011 to 2015. So is there more recent data on, you know, wildfire, what causes wildfires and, you know, specifically on PG&E power lines? So maybe that would be a good place to start. Yeah, I, 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 I can address that in, in general. The, the more recent data, uh, that trend holds true. And I, I think, uh, you know, if, if I recall the question specifically, it's important for us to point out that that uh, at least more localized data would probably show us that that number is significantly overestimating the risk of power lines on Christmas Tree Hill. Uh, uh, and, and the reason being that in none of the fires that we're aware of that have started recently in California from uh, uh, you know, power lines, in none of those cases were those power lines located in the communities that ultimately burned. As I, as I described before, those power lines are located some distance away. They ignite a wildfire, which then burns towards a community. We think that that risk is very real here in Corte Madera and all of central Marin. Really, everybody uh, uh, you know, in Marin at some level is at risk of that. Um, but, but I think the, the greater point is, and what I didn't emphasize in my initial discussion, is that we're not worried about the power lines in your front yard, and we don't think those are the ones you should be most worried about. Uh, if, if I lived on Christmas Tree Hill, and I, I, frankly, I live in a community that's just as at risk, my, my concern needs to be with the power lines that are potentially miles to the north and east of me. Um, I, and, and so uh, I, I just wanna reframe this and, and make sure that people understand that from the fire services perspective, we're gonna be looking at the places where the fire is most likely to start that's actually gonna impact your neighborhood. So we may be pushing to underground power lines miles from your neighborhood in an effort that's truly based on the data to protect your neighborhood. That may be difficult to grasp and I understand it doesn't satisfy that anxiety about the power lines you look out uh, your front door at, but, but we do have some understanding and some science to back up the approach that we need to be looking in specific locations that put neighborhoods at risk. Uh, frankly, when the fire starts in your front yard, you're, you're in the safest location. You're the one who's gonna get the fire engines within five minutes. It's the people who live downwind of the fire when it's grown beyond the ability of the local fire service to control that are most at risk. And that's what we've seen over and over again. Santa Rosa in 2017, Santa Rosa again in 2020. Um, uh, uh, the Camp Fire, the Thomas Fire, these were all these places where it was that fire once it had had an opportunity to grow 
and impact communities as a wind-driven wildfire that it really caused the problems that we're worried about. I hope that makes sense. Uh, you know, feel free to ask for, uh, for clarification or keep pushing me until you feel like you understand what I'm get getting at here. Well, Todd, not being a wildfire expert myself, one of the questions was about like, would more local data help with that process or, you know, maybe just elucidate a little bit on like what sort of data goes into an analysis and if like, you know, a local study for the WUI or if that's already been done. I know, I, absolutely. I, you know, we're very interested in understanding the, the uh, more local data. And I think uh, we've got some representatives from PG&E here who can, might be able to help us understand what uh, you know what is being done right now um, uh, understanding the risks in in at the local level probably focuses more on the specific vulnerabilities of the infrastructure the hardware um, and the other piece of this that we want folks to understand that the fire department certainly doesn't oppose undergrounding power lines uh, and we're not here to advocate one way or the other but we want you to understand why it may look like we're not focusing on this exclusively we have a very, a very real interest in uh, some of the other measures, which are uh, uh, often significantly more achievable, less expensive to undertake, things like hardening the power poles themselves, using insulated tree lines where, where those lines may, might make uh, contact with limbs of trees, um, uh, you know, uh, other technology that we're aware of that PG&E is researching and installing um, that can help cut the power faster, grid upgrades. There, there's all kinds of things that can help mitigate the risk of those power lines starting fires that don't necessarily involve undergrounding. And we're interested in all of those approaches and really interested in understanding where the lines are most vulnerable because we want those issues addressed, no doubt about it. Um, but again, you know, when we look at it, the fire that starts on Christmas Tree Hill may actually be a bigger risk to the neighbors behind you in Mill Valley than to the residents on Christmas Tree it's, Hill itself, as, as counterintuitive as that may seem. Sasha, there was a question in the chat relating to um, asking about acreage of fires recently, and I know we have some of that data, and I think it speaks to some of the points that Todd's making, if, um, if we can move over to that slide. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm trying to pull up the I question think, um, specifically. Yeah, we have it. Um, Sasha, are we able to show that um, through our slideshow? Yeah, I can show the acreage. And the question was just, you know, how do some of the acreage of recent fires compare? Yeah, so so 2020 is a, you know, something of an outlier. It was that in in our lifetimes, it was the year that we saw the most acreage burned in California. Um, you know, it was actually what we saw last year as, as significant as it was, was much uh, less acreage than we saw historically even 100 years ago. Um, so, so the fire service has been very successful for the last 100 years in controlling wildfires. Um, we're becoming in some ways less and less able to, to uh, contain those fires at a reasonable size. In 2020, the acreage that you saw had a lot to do with the uh, you know, lightning ignitions of wildfires statewide that happened simultaneously and overwhelmed our ability to suppress fires. We, we simply ran out of resources uh, up and down the state to fight the number of fires that we saw. So most of those fires, had they been an isolated incident, would have been controlled at a much smaller size. When we had hundreds of fires start simultaneously, that wasn't an option. Um, I hope, hope that makes sense. That said, we are concerned with climate change. We know that climate change is affecting uh, uh, the length of our fire season. Uh, it's, it's increasing drought conditions. So our, our, the vegetation that depends on seasonal moisture is not seeing enough of the seasonal moisture or they're seeing a longer dry season, which could put stress on plants, which contribute to in many cases, more intense wildfires or fires that are harder for us to control. So there's a whole host of factors related to climate change that can exacerbate wildfires. Um, but, you know, I'm going to segue this into, I think, the sort of the discussion about the inequity uh, appearance in the, the climate adaptation plan. I don't think that the, the fire department agrees with that necessarily. Uh, well, we want to under, uh, you folks to understand, and what we've said in the meetings with, uh, with Adaptation International as this plan was being developed, uh, wildfires are here to stay. They, wildfires are going to be here whether we're able to reverse climate change or not. 
So, so uh, while wildfires are being exacerbated in some respects by climate change, and we think it's important to, to deal with climate change now, um, we also understand that mitigating climate change does not make an immediate reversal in the trend of wildfires. Um, I, there's a whole host of other factors contributing to these wildfires, fire suppression in itself, uh, continuing building patterns into the wildland urban interface, uh, you know, uh, increased population and increased ignition sources from human causes. Um, all, all of these things contribute to what we're seeing today and climate change is just one of those pieces. And then Sasha, I can speak to the prevention and enforcement component of it. I know there was a few questions on there and comments made of, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of tragedy or flesh or however it was put. Um, and I agree, as the former fire marshal, prevention is everything um, until the incident happens. So for us as fire prevention, we've been doing um, several methods. So with fire prevention, we, we call the three E's. One is education, to let you know what the hazards are and how to mitigate them, both at the fire department level and at the community level. There's the engineering on how can we build or change model codes to be able to harden your structures and what can we do to try to reduce some of that exterior wildfire uh, ignition potential. And then there's the enforcement component, which I think a lot of homeowners are really concerned about because yes, you did your defensible space, but you're frustrated because your neighbors have it. Um, one of the things that we look at in um, fire prevention or how everybody's kind of reframing it through the fire service is called community risk reduction reduction. And when we say community risk reduction is because it takes all of us as community members to try to reduce that risk. Part of it is through education. The other part of it is through action as homeowners doing your defensible space, doing your home hardening, taking care of your evacuation routes and so forth. So it takes all of us to do that component of it. The enforcement component of this, which everybody's saying, why aren't you making my neighbor cut their weeds? Or why aren't you making my neighbor cut their bamboo? And some people had referenced the recent ordinances passed by San Rafael, I believe it was this week. Um, so when it comes to enforcement, I can tell you, because I sit on the Fire Prevention Officers Association within the county, is Corte Madera is the only agency that is forcefully abating properties throughout the county. And that's for sure, and why? Because to abate a property, which I believe we did two or three properties about a year and a half ago, it takes anywhere from 12 to 18 months to go through the entire abatement process. It's laborious, it, is it takes a lot of staff hours, and it's because homeowners have property rights and they're protected under the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. So we have to honor those rights and there's certain times where we have to get court ordered abatements and warrants to go down that portion of it. So we've done it, we're doing the enforcement component of it. When MMW or MWPA came aboard, they provided that, fun, that steady funding stream to be able to provide home assessments to the individual parcel level. For example, last year we did approximately 2,000 homes, which are primarily all around the Christmas Tree Hill and the western or the eastern slopes of the Mount Tam watershed. With that, we gave homeowners um, instructions on how to harden their home, what defensible space um, procedures they needed to do, and what vegetation should be removed. The first year of this pilot program through MM MWPA was the education component. So we basically give you the information on what you need to do to be safer. And then we come back this year and then the following years and start the enforcement component or that, hey, this is a reminder, you haven't done it, why not? And at the end of the day, when it comes down to um, removing vegetation is who's going to do it and who's going to pay for it. And that's what a lot of homeowners look at is this is going to cost me X amount of dollars to remove all this veg vegetation. And I agree. It is, um, it's difficult and laborious to enforce a lot of these um, um, defensible space regulations, but we as a fire department are the only ones in the county that are actually enforcing it, believe it or not. Um, and Todd Lando can attest to it and Todd Kismano can attest to it. it um, we've done it. And so for me, what I implore you as homeowners is that community risk reduction takes all of us. The fire department can't do it all for yourself. 
Um, we're doing the prevention side of it. We're educating you on what you can do. We're doing the enforcement component of it. And then with Measure C, we're even doing pilot programs where we're doing some home voluntary abatements where we'll do some cost sharing with several homeowners and try to reduce some of the um, hazardous fuels around your properties. That's great. Yeah, we're all in it together. <laughs> um, there are a bunch more comments coming in. There's particularly a whole group around PG&E power lines and distribution lines. There are also three people who've had their hands up. So maybe we could- yeah, Sasha, before we jump over there, I just, I just want to yeah. um, introduce um, Mark Van Gorder and um, Jim Wickham from PG&E. I, I don't think I made the introduction for them at the early stage. And I don't know if you guys want to give a quick intro for us, please. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> hello, uh, RJ and <clears throat> everyone. Um, Manager Cusimano, we, we appreciate the invitation to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Mark Van Gorder. I handle government relations, so typically work with county supervisors, city council members, city managers, and of course, RJ and I have been working together, I don't know, six or seven years, even from uh, before he was with the town of Puerto Madera. So it's good to have the relationships that we've built, to have the partnerships. We certainly work. Um, uh, I'll actually toss this over to Jim Wickham if he's if he's off mute. You know, Jim Jim's our public safety specialist, so uh, he works more in the fire and first responder areas. I don't know if Jim's uh, off mute. Yeah, hello, Mark. Can you, can you hear me now? I see. I hear you. I'm, I'm trying to get my camera here. I, I hate to be on. Uh, so my name is Jim Wickham. I'm the public safety specialist. And for you residents in Corn Madera, I live in Mill Valley and actually worked uh, for Mill Valley Police Department for 37 years. So I've been involved with emergency management for a long time. And my primary job is working with your local fire department, police department, and the Office of Emergency Services and our local division and our EOC, our Emergency Operations Center in San Francisco. I'm heavily involved with PSPS, the power shutoff, and working on mitigation of uh, hardening our infrastructure with our local agencies, with especially fire and police departments. So I'm here to support Mark Van Gorder today, and hopefully answer some questions. I've been actively involved in Marin County my whole life, so I know the area pretty well and uh, look forward to hear some comments and, and try to provide some information on what we're doing to mitigate the issue of wildland fires caused by utility lines. So thank you for this uh, opportunity. All right, great. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks for being here this evening. I mean, maybe that's a good opportunity to dive into the suite of questions that are around distribution in lines and how they can impact and have started fires in the past and you know what PG&E is working on. I can, some of the specific com comments in the question and answer were, you know, what's the difference in risk between electrical transmission lines versus the distribution lines? You know, how, where's the power source for Corte Madera come from? And, you know, how does that affect the potential wildfire risk? in the region and kind of thinking regionally, like how is the region working together to address some of these concerns? And of course, how does it tie back into the PSPS events? So I think Jim and I probably will tag team a little bit here back and forth. <clears throat> um, I may be forgetting, I, and uh, certainly RJ or, or Todd could, could comment on this. I'm thinking that we gave a presentation and I'm, and I'm happy to do it again. It's probably a good thing to do, <clears throat> but, um, uh, a good chunk of last year, I was visiting with the 20 plus jurisdictions. I work in both uh, Marin and Napa counties. And so uh, I was basically going on tour virtually given, given COVID um, and, and, and presenting uh, our, our electric infrastructure, the transmission lines. And it was basically, you know, pg &E, uh, Electricity 101, you know, where does the electricity flow from? How does it get to the substations? Amp you know, down to the uh, voltage dropping down to the smaller substations, the Green Brace substation, the, the Alto substation, Mill Valley. And, and then, they, then it goes into the distribution lines. <clears throat> and um, uh, this area in, in Cordillera is, is fed by 
at least a lot of the Christmas tree hill area is fed by um, the Alto substation in Mill Valley. Main point in, in mentioning that is that um, I, I'm happy to make that presentation again. To do it well it takes about an hour, um, and I know we don't have the time for that tonight. <clears throat> so what I would just simply say is that uh, I think it's a follow-up meeting. I'll just throw that out there. Um, I'm, we're here at your pleasure, and we'll you know, follow your lead, but it is a, an extensive discussion. Um, Jim, do you want to comment any more on, on that? No, I think you pretty well covered it, and we could take the questions that come up and discuss it further. So the, the follow-up, there was another, if you could just sort of give them to me one at a time, what was the next question you had there? Um, the next was just the, you know, the relative risk between transmission lines versus distribution lines. And as you were joining the call, Todd was talking about how 8% of fires in California are caused by transmission lines, but that was older data. So is there newer data and how do those two things kind of go together? Well, so I'll make a couple comments. And again, when it gets to sort of the public safety and, and, and fire aspects, I, I really do defer to the local fire professionals, which is fantastic that we have such great representation here. Um, <clears throat> you know, one of the things that we are continually uh, working to do, and this is something we've been doing for, for years, it's, it's nothing new, is uh, we will go through annually, sometimes every other year, every jurisdiction uh, where our lines are. And again, we have the transmission lines. People are familiar with our transmission lines. They're, they're usually the very tall uh, lines. They are, um, you know, if you're driving along Highway 37, typically, but not always, they're on the large steel tower structures. Um, and then sometimes, we'll, you know, then we have transmission lines that are on wooden poles, but they'll, they'll be fairly tall. They're not your common power poles when you're driving down through the neighborhoods and see the power poles. The top, you'll see usually three wires. That's our distribution lines. And then below it, sometimes people get confused. You know, the heavier, thicker black, black wire below that, that's usually your um, Comcast uh, communications uh, cables and infrastructure that are on those lines. So <clears throat> just trying to give people a, a picture of the differences between the two. Um, both of our transmission and, and some of our, you know, a lot of our distribution do run up into the high fire threat districts. And again, a lot of this is in the presentation that, that we gave and can give again. Um, but we are constantly trying to remove vegetation away from those lines on an annual basis and uh, working with property owners to have what we call enhanced vegetation management to clear, to clear out space from those lines uh, um, to reduce the chances of ignition. Jim, do you want to add anything to that? No, I think, you know, for distribution for you guys in Corte Madera, uh, back in 2017, um, when we realized that the environment in California has drastically changed with, you know, the 125 million dead trees and we saw started seeing these massive fires. And at that time, that's when our utility realized that uh, we're not equipped to um, handle this new environmental issue that we're addressing, the high winds, the high fire dangers, and, you know, the CAL FIRE and pg &E then put together the, all the utilities, a risk uh, area in tier one, two, or three. And Christmas Tree Hill fell under that tier three area, which based on the topography, vegetation, a variety of topics that CAL FIRE and we worked with, you guys are in a higher risk area. And we all know in Marin County, I think 75% of the county is probably high risk. Mill Valley is 75% of our community is high risk. So uh, this, our distribution lines, we began a process three years ago of uh, replacing the power lines with coated wire, uh, hardening our poles. Uh, we do twice a year checks of all of our lines, our poles. Um, our transmission lines, obviously, we've done numerous checks on them recently in the last two years. And you do have transmission towers along US 101 that feed that Alto substation where you guys get your power to Corn Madera. And your power comes uh, from Mill Valley to Scott Valley area on under hill, up over the hill into the Christmas tree area. So we have a heavy uh, vegetation management program that we work with the county on and the cities. 
because obviously our biggest concern is vegetation, trees falling onto our power lines, knocking the water down and causing a fire, especially on those summer days where we have red flag days. Henceforth, why uh, until we can get control of the environment and uh, the power lines, we started the public safety power shutoff, which is another program that when all these triggers come together, this risk is very extreme. We basically shut the power off because the uh, risk is too high for our communities and for our utility to allow the power to flow. And that's something we're trying to mitigate in the next you know, four to five years to where we don't have to have power shutoffs anymore in, in uh, California. So that's kind of my overview of what we're trying to do here. And hopefully Mark, that kind of puts a broader picture of what's going on. Becca, can you give Mark the capability to screen share? Uh, yes, I can. Um, I also wanted to say that uh, I, I've checked our records. The Mark Van Gorder's presentation to council was at the October 20th, 2020 uh, council meeting. I actually have the meeting open and I've got the link to share and I can share that in the comments if anyone wanna, wants to click on it and save it to watch later. Yeah, I yeah, appreciate that too. One of the reasons that I do enjoy making a city council presentation is most most are frequently recorded. Uh, I thought that was the case. So thank you, uh, Rebecca. I, I should have mentioned as well that Rebecca has been tremendously helpful in uh, in helping us to continue the partnership, not just not just with Corte Madera, but frankly, uh, throughout the county of Marin. Um, so I'm going to have to say thank you while we're while we're here, uh, helping me engage with many other elected officials so I appreciate it can can someone confirm because I never can tell when we're when we're doing this uh, I think I'm sharing my screen and you should see sort of our vegetation management program yep it's there Mark it's there great um, I'm going to cover this very briefly for two reasons <clears throat> one it's a document that I believe I may have sent to to uh, Todd and RJ and others earlier today so that's how I can send that to Rebecca. That's something that we can make publicly available uh, via the city's website or email email list or what have you. But <clears throat> I just wanted to briefly show uh, that, you know, th th these are our, this is our program. We're constantly working to uh, make clearance around the lines. <clears throat> uh, we know the trees are very personal to many people. Um, a lot of folks don't like having the trees cleared away from the power lines. I think we, we all understand the safety reasons for it, and it's required by the California Public Utilities Commission. Where we're able to um, go beyond uh, the, the, the requirements, we do talk to property owners um, and, and see if we can get extended, you know, 12 feet. Sometimes we can get 20 feet further out <clears throat> to avoid um, trees that, that may have the potential to fall, to fall into the line. So, just wanted to point this out again. I won't go into the details of it. Uh, I will send this out just so that folks who may not know uh, who are watching tonight that we have the vegetation management program. Um, <clears throat> I did hear clearly uh, the interest, and we'll certainly we'll certainly talk a little bit about it. Um, you know, in, in uh, investigating or looking into what are the options related to undergrounding. So certainly don't want to uh, skip that. But. Um, PG&E is, is taking uh, a multi-pronged approach or, or we're using as many tools in the toolbox that are most appropriate uh, where we can <clears throat> to reduce uh, the need for those public safety power shutoffs. So I did see the question, you know, wh why we have to have public safety power shutoffs. Um, and, and part of the work that we're doing, again, I, you know, I know everyone here can read, so I'm not going to read it, read through it. But, but here are the many different ways that we are tr trying to um, create a stronger, more resilient uh, system to mitigate the potential uh, possibilities of, of ignition <clears throat> and the concern for fires. And yes, we are looking at targeted undergrounding for select overhead lines. Um, but uh, one of the things that you know, I want to, to mention is that <clears throat> for, for in, in our in our service territory, and I don't have a map of it, but it, uh, you know, it goes from the Oregon border and, and for our purposes, you know, down into San Luis Obispo area. Um, one third of the 
uh, electric lines that provide our customers with power are in a high fire threat district area designated designated by the California Public Utilities Commission. So um, there, we are doing a lot of work and they are looking at areas where we can perform undergrounding. Uh, the question is the amount of resources we have available to get that done, how fast it can get done. Uh, does it make the most sense? And I, you know, I think you've heard some comments from, from Cal Fire uh, and your local fire officials uh, tonight. <clears throat> um, I'll just restate it, you know, in 2020, California, Oregon, and Washington saw the most active, I think everyone that's participating in this call knows, that most active and damaging wildfire season in our history. Um, since 2015, uh, I've personally watched the fires grow and every single year, uh, the folks from Cal OES uh, will come in to the emergency operations centers in, in Napa County, in Lake County, Sonoma County, and say this year, each year, it's always the bigger, the biggest fires they've ever seen. And the fire weather and the fire activity is behaving in, in ways that people have never seen before. So um, again, this document is available. I will, I will um, resend it or send it back out. <clears throat> I'm gonna stop there uh, just in case that generated questions. I did want to show one last thing about the undergrounding process, because again, I, I'm hearing that that's a, a core interest of some of the folks that are participating in the call tonight. Um, to, just checking with our facilitator, do you no. do I proceed? Um, well, Mark, that sounds, I mean, it sounds great there. You, Unless you have a time limit, I would love to just open it up for a couple of people who've been waiting to, you know, add some comments and thoughts to the mix and then come back both to the undergrounding priorities. And then yeah. there were, yeah, there was some discussion about evacuation and also um, it's a pilot project that PG&E has done in the past and some questions about whether that could be applied in Christmas Tree Hill or not. So maybe we'll just pause briefly and then come back to those other topics. Happy, to, yeah, happy to stand by. All right, Rebecca, can you Ready help us go on? To this? Oh, let me, oh, there we go. Now I can see what's going on. We're right, all the great comments were running out of space, so we'll capture yes. the next set on the next. Okay, the, uh, I'm trying to make sure my, my timer is on. The next um, attendee to speak will be uh, Christmas Tree Hill NRG. Are you able to unmute yourself? I have unmuted myself. Thank you, Rebecca and Todd and Sasha and Ruben and the rest of the team. We appreciate the information you're sharing with us. Um, you've heard from the team that's working on the study on undergrounding, so I'm not going to address that again. Um, from the perspective of the Christmas Tree Hill neighborhood response group, I just wanted to touch on a couple of issues that are important to us. Um, we've stressed, I think, or Matt stressed that we don't feel that the plan places enough emphasis on wildfire prevention and mitigation, um, and we certainly support that, uh, that observation. We feel that the plan is heavy on problem identification and light on concrete and specific prevention and mitigation strategies. Um, and given that the plan is a macro roadmap for future action, we believe that some of the issues that I'm about to raise should be addressed without delay on a more expedited basis. Um, the plan relies to a great extent on a business as usual approach to wildfire prevention and mitigation, i.e. education, low level defensible space enforcement, occasional tripper days, superficial inspections and sporadic fuel hazard reduction and vegetation management projects. From our perspective, this approach has proven inadequate to for wildfire and falls far short of the response necessary to meet the exigency of the circumstances that we find ourselves in. We fully recognize that a lack of funding has played a key role in this in the past, but Measure C has now, in part, remedied this funding deficiency. From our perspective, um, in the short term, it's all about managing fuel, um, clearing out dead trees, vegetation, etc. And given the immediacy of the wildfire threat, especially that we're in the midst of a drought, it's imperative that the plan reflect a more aggressive approach to defensible space enforcement, fuel hazard reduction, and vegetation management. 
To be more effective, the town must, for example, take immediate steps to prohibit the planting of highly flammable plants like bamboo and juniper, require the removal of existing plantings, enact ordinances that impose fines for defensible space violations, because the abatement process is simply too onerous. Okay. Uh, Time has expired. Okay, I have submitted my comments in writing, so uh, thank you for your time. Yes, and they were received and they, they've been shared. Thank you. Thank you. Wonder, hey, we only have a couple of hands up. I know we have other comments we want to get to them, but uh, Anita, were you close to finishing? I mean, I know we have your comments, but um, I, you know, we've been talking for a little while. I just want to give the residents an opportunity to. <clears throat> okay, she, she was muted, uh, but I uh, just. Okay. Thank you, Todd. Um, so removing, you know, ordinances to remove these plantings and to uh, have fines for um, violations uh, are, in our opinion, very important. Uh, you know, for example, the town center in Puerto Madera is ringed by juniper and Christmas Tree Hill is full of bamboo and juniper stands. And we just feel that the message that tolerating these ongoing fire risk sends is that Puerto Madera doesn't take the issue of defensible space as seriously as necessary under the circumstances and doesn't fully understand the immediacy of the threat. So we would like the plan to reflect that business as usual is no longer good enough um, and we don't feel that it addresses and emphasizes that. Um, the plan lacks, uh, in addition, in, in closing, I would say that from our perspective, the plan lacks specificity. Uh, we've talked about the lack of specificity on uh, undergrounding as a, as a potential mitigation strategy. Um, and finally, the plan is silent as to the role of the NRGs. And we would just suggest that this is a significant oversight. The NRGs play a major role in educating and preparing residents for disasters. Uh, and Todd, you're fully familiar with, uh, I think the important work that is done through the NRG. So I think some recognition of their role so that they have a roadmap for what's required of them would be uh, in order. Thank you for the opportunity to provide input. Okay. Great, thank you for those comments. Next. For the next comment? Yeah. Uh, the next attendee to speak will be Roy Wolford. Good evening. I have two questions. I hope uh, Todd Lando and both Mark and Jim can uh, address each. First one is the uh, PG&E uh, management uh, program. I spoke with the uh, service, uh, the trimming service foreman about a year and a half ago, and he had indicated that there's the, the, uh, there's a major problem in Marin County and that over 50% of the property owners refuse to allow PG&E to come on to their property. And I, I think uh, Chief Martin had addressed that. So I want to find out what is being done to encourage or, or get the, the folks that aren't participating, the private property owners, and also the folks in government. You know, is it just private property owners or is it the government folks that are the issue here in getting uh, veg, uh, vegetation management done? So that's that question. The other question, uh, it has to do with uh, the Point Reyes fire, the Woodward fire in 2020. And I, I think that's, that's uh, a, a case of where perhaps a defensible uh, spaces were created because on the west, you had the Pacific Ocean. On the south, you had Bear Valley Trail. In the east and the north, you had Limiter Road and the Coastal Trail. And I know there was, in the media, there was a lot of concern about uh, there's another wildfire. It's going to go out and burn a lot of different areas, but it was contained because of the defensible areas. So I'd like... Uh, Todd to speak to that. And then also on the vegetation management side for that area, so it's government property. We know it's U.S. government property. And I, I recall reading that uh, there hadn't been a wildfire or vegetation management out there for something like 80 or 90 years. So there's a case where vegetation management wasn't done at all, and perhaps that led to uh, a, a greater uh, fueling of that fire. So those are my questions. Thank you, Roy, for adding those into the mix. Looks like we have one more hand up. Is 
Okay. Does uh, it look like, sorry, um, Kevin, there's one more hand. Yes. So I appreciate everyone's input tonight and their time tonight. Um, and Todd, I appreciate the town's willingness to have an independent assessment done of the undergrounding of power lines. Um, there have been a number of comments that have been made over the last couple of weeks that, well, it's only the transmission lines that are causing the uh, fires. I would encourage everyone to look at the Cal Fire website with their press releases going back um, from 2017 to present. And you're gonna find that the distribution lines are actually the, uh, the highest source of overwhelmingly actually of the fires and not the transmission lines. And then I do have a couple of questions for the PG&E folks. I'm wondering what would be the cost savings of not having to trim trees and hardening your lines and your poles and things of that nature if the power lines were put underground? Great, thanks, Kevin. Um, and there are some more groups of questions here, and I don't know, Ruben and Todd, one of the ones that you yeah, know, was in. I'll start on one. Um, so I can start on the responsibility of vegetation management in Marin. Um, so the property owner where the vegetation resides is the responsibility of that owner. So for example, if the vegetation is on private property, such as um, a single family residence, then that homeowner is responsible for maintaining that defensible space or vegetation management. If there's vegetation management out in county open space or state parks, the vegetation management in that open space is only required if there's structures involved. Otherwise, where are you managing the vegetation for? Um, when it comes to control burns, it's each jurisdiction has its own policies based on whether they will allow control burn or not. Um, like for us in a municipal um, locality with the town of Corvidera and the city of Larkspur, with so many residents intermixed within the wildland urban interface, it's difficult to do a control burn because there are no defined lines in ways where firefighters can actually be a holding force to be able to do that control burn. Now we're talking amongst ourselves as fire chiefs and as fire prevention officers throughout the county, and you will be seeing a lot more controlled burns happening throughout the county, but they'll probably be happening more in open space areas as opposed to in areas or communities that are within the intermix. Um, let's see one other. So yeah, private property and vegetation management compliance. So yeah, so with the property vegetation compliance is within our uh, municipal code, we have section 4907.2, which mirrors the state's uh, California Public Resource Code 4291 that basically states anyone who owns, controls, or leases property in an area that's uh, prone to wildfires needs to do steps A through Z to maintain that defensible space. Once you go beyond that space into other people property, then it's that other person's property that needs to maintain that particular space. For us as fire departments, we go out and do initial um, defensible space inspections and try to do the enforcement component of it. Unfortunately, we just don't have the resources available. And what I mean resources are bodies. And then the, to be able to go out there and try to abate every property. And it basically means um, I've got 4,000 parcels within the WUI that are under our jurisdiction. And that means I've got 4,000 individual homeowners that I need to um, interact with to try to make, make sure that they're maintaining their defensible space. And then I believe Todd, if he's on, can maybe talk to um, some of the components of the Woodward fire. Um, and yes, I agree. There were some components that kept that fire contained, which was um, Highway 1, uh, the Pacific Ocean, and then the two trails that were there. That's why for us as fire mitigation managers, both Todd and myself, have been looking at areas where we can use this Measure C core funding dollars, which is what we talked about, that $20 million coming over the next 10 years, on how can we protect or best protect the community. And part of that is proposing shaded fuel breaks by removing a lot of that undergrowth that is basically that receptive fuel bed if an ember lands or if a 
or if a line should go down in the open space, it at least protects that buffer between your property and the open space. And so that's in, um, in plans now. And we're hopefully, that's gonna be about a four or five year uh, plan to come through and remove the vegetation. But just remember vegetation is a year round maintenance. Once you cut it, it grows back. Is we always make the analogy is vegetation management is like painting the Golden Gate Bridge. You don't paint it once, is you paint it and you gotta come back over and over and over again and continually treat it. So for homeowners that live on Christmas Tree Hill, that's a lifetime worth of property maintenance. Yep. Todd, when you're jumping in, there's a question here that like kind of speaks to that about, you know, if the wildfire risk is really coming from areas outside of an area like Christmas Tree Hill, like what are the, as a concerned citizens, like what are the ways they can really help mitigate that risk? You know, how can they work together to, to address that? So maybe you could touch on that too. Well, uh, yeah, I, I'm going to uh, step back and then I'll get to that. I just, the, 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 you know, the Woodward fire, I, I think has some relevance in that, that discussion. Um, I, you know, first, it, it, it's absolutely true amongst our colleagues uh, in the fire service. We, we, we're now kidding each other, kidding uh, uh, the firefighters from outside of Marin and pointing out that Marin's fire was the smallest in the state last year. Um, uh, that, you know, while our fire service here in Marin is fantastic, I think it's more a reflection of luck. That was caused by lightning. The lightning struck close to the coast in a remote wilderness area inside the national park, far from homes. Had that lightning fire started on the slopes of Mount Tamalpais, frankly, we might be having a totally different discussion tonight. Um, uh, but but uh, we that fire did start. It was not defensible space that that held it. It was you know luck that it like like uh, Chief Martin pointed out that the highway was there, that Limantour Road was there, and that it started close to the coast. Uh, with the wind blowing it towards the ocean. Um, I, and to some extent that, that that analogy goes that you know we're concerned about the location that these fires start. where they where they start makes a big difference. And I can't emphasize enough. We, we, it's not that we're not concerned about power lines starting fires. We think that those eight percent of ignitions caused by wildfires or by by downed power lines are, are critical. They're important. They've obviously caused, to, you know, tens of billions of dollars of damage and many, many dozens of people have lost their lives now from fires started from power lines. We understand that we want to mitigate that, um, uh, but where those lines were located, how those fires start have a uh, 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 have more complexity to them than simply looking out our front doors, seeing power lines and assuming that undergrounding those power lines in our front yard are the ones that are gonna make a difference for us. We're much more interested in looking at the locations that are actually putting Christmas Tree Hill at risk, the fire scenarios that are putting you most at risk. So that comes around to really the, the, this question. We believe that the, the first step that has to happen regardless of the ignition source of a wildfire needs to be personal preparedness, home hardening, which you as a homeowner are absolutely in control of, and, and then defensible space on your own property. We need to worry a lot less about what's happening on our neighbor's property because it's what happens within five feet of the walls of your home that have the biggest impact on whether your home is going to survive a fire or not. Um, I, and again, it, you need to be just as concerned or more concerned about the 92% of fires that aren't gonna start from the power lines, uh, uh, you know, regardless if they're in your front yard or the power lines uh, you know, at Phoenix Lake. So, so focusing on your own property, your own, the first five feet and your structure itself is the most important thing you can do. And then I, I, I can't thank, uh, you know, the uh, uh, residents of Marin enough for passing tax measure C in 2020. This was the most critical, uh, in, you know, uh, 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 step that we've taken, certainly in my lifetime to, to start to tackle these issues. Um, the $20 million a year for the next 10 years is already making an impact in your community. You've seen uh, more work in the last year, uh, uh, you know, more dollars invested in fuels management and hazard mitigation in Corte Madera than you probably saw in the prior 10 years. That's because the money started flowing in July and we hit the ground running, we really have. We have dozens of projects happening right now, and you're gonna to start to see some of the larger core projects of the, the tax measure C, the MWPA, develop over the, the, the course of the next year. This organization is just getting started. You'll see uh, the, the construction of 
shaded fuel breaks, which are fuel reduction zones around the entirety of your community. We're going to be starting at uh, the Corte Madera grade and the base of Christmas Tree Hill, because we do recognize that that neighborhood is the one with the greatest risk in our community. We're, we're starting there. We, you've already seen some of the work uh, undertaken in the last six months along the middle and lower summit fire roads. Uh, that's the start of a long-term project to mitigate risk at the perimeter, at the periphery of the community, so that when a fire starts, whether it's from power lines or a vehicle fire or a structure fire or kids playing with matches, uh, somewhere in the watershed to the north and east of you in all likelihood, when that fire reaches the community, we wanna see the intensity of the fire reduced as it reaches the edge of your neighborhood to give the firefighters a chance to control the fire before it does damage in the neighborhood. This is all part of a, a grand plan. Now, you know, I, 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 I think uh, we have to have some thick skin as we read some of these comments and, and see that, that maybe the community doesn't understand that we've literally devoted our lives to this. I think uh, just, just today we've probably spent, Ruben and I, 12 hours in meeting after meeting with the other stakeholders, with the other fire agencies, with land managers, with planners, with the science community, uh, uh, just dealing with this issue in Corte Madera and Larkspur. Um, I, and working with it on a regional level as well with our neighboring agencies. Uh, again, I, I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is that you worry about what's happening in Kentfield and San Anselmo and Ross, because those neighboring communities are in all likelihood where the fire that impacts your neighborhood is going to start. We recognize that and that's why we're engaged with them constantly working to develop plans, to develop regional strategies and start to uh, invest the, the, uh, the, the money through tax measure C that you've entrusted us with. Long way to answer. No, it's all right. It's nice to see, you know, a glimpse into all the work that you're doing, though. It would be hard to walk in your shoes for those 12 hours today. And thanks for being here so late tonight to continue that. Um, there are a couple of PG&E focused questions that maybe we can pivot to, um, particularly, you know, building on the undergrounding conversation that's a theme for tonight. Like, hey, there's a question about how does PG&E prioritize areas for undergrounding? And would it be appropriate or relevant to look at Christmas Tree Hill specifically in that conversation? Sorry, could you, could you say that again? Uh, the audio cut out for just a minute. Yeah, sorry, there was a quest there are a couple of questions about PG&E's role in undergrounding and how PG&E chooses what areas it makes sense and prioritizes undergrounding and if PG&E would be willing to like come out and look at Christmas Tree Hill specifically as part of that prioritization evaluation. So there's a few there's a few questions in there. So let me start out with the PG&E coming out and and looking at Christmas Tree Hill. <clears throat> um We've had ongoing conversations with, with neighbors and appreciate the partnership and the opportunities to talk uh, to some of the folks. I'm sure there may be some that we haven't talked with, um, but uh, I'd say the last two and a half, possibly three years, I know it started in 2018, I can't remember exactly when. Um, and uh, we have, you know, the company has taken a look at it. It's, you know, I think there's, it isn't PG to take a look at Christmas Tree Hill. Uh, the company is taking a look, and as I mentioned, you know, uh, one third of our territory, of our service territory, uh, has high fire threat district areas, has uh, lines where we're taking a look at undergrounding, and so it's it's balancing where are the where are the top priorities. Um, so that's part of it. Um, what we're doing right now <clears throat> is uh, we're using. Um, wildfire technology it's called uh, techno silva um, they're used by cal fire and, and other utilities uh, for protection planning operational uh, planning and, and taking a look at where where do we need to mitigate um, and how do we mitigate and what's the best options and um, so uh, that's one of the things that we're doing <clears throat> artificial advanced uh, intelligence technology to to look at how we can um, uh, 
you know, determine where we can do the best system hardening, what's appropriate for what place, what's the most cost effective use of the dollars. So um, again, we're happy to continue conversations with, with the town. Uh, we have had conversations with, with residents at Christmas Tree Hill about this. Um, happy to, uh, after I've taken a look at some of these new models um, that we have coming out, I, I guess in the next month or two, uh, talk through the decisions that the company's making, where it's gonna have system hardening, what areas may have underground projects and, and share uh, that information. <clears throat> One of the, um, sorry, I've lost my spot here. But uh, to, to the question of, um, of undergrounding uh, and the way that that can work, I just I will copy these links. I'm, I can put them into the chat for ease of ease of access. I'll, I'll send them to the uh, city clerk, Rebecca and others. Um, uh, and, I, and I also saw a comment asking a question about why, why I haven't been in contact with the, with the mayor. I have been in contact with the mayor, so I'm, I'm not sure where the confusion is there, but certainly we've been talking uh, about various issues. And uh, so we, we do talk, we do connect, but just to show some of the various uh, projects throughout our service territory that are undergrounding projects. These are what we call rule 20 projects. And um, we've had a number of them that's working directly with the, with the cities and um, I've, I've experienced both uh, undergrounding projects and worked with people from our service planning department um, on those a lot in Tiburon, both requested by the city um, and also uh, a number of projects re requested by, by neighborhoods. So I'm just scrolling through to show you the number of undergrounding projects that are what we call rule 20 projects. <clears throat> Again, I'll send this link, I'll put it in chat. But this is this talks about converting electric overhead lines to underground and, and without again spending too much time because there's other questions other people want to talk we have something called the rule 20a the rule 20b and the rule 20c um, process for for undergrounding this link that i'll send will help everybody understand what how do we do this how do we work with the cities how do we work on these rule 20b and c uh, projects where you would want to work with the, the city council and the public works department, as you can see here, um, you know, we, we have to do some estimating, we have to do some designing and take a look at what those costs would be so people can understand what the cost impacts are. So again, I'm sorry for talking fast. I know it's a lot of information, but I'm also aware that other people want to talk. Sasha, can I jump in there real quick? I, just, I do want to circle back because, you know, dealing with a lot of other public agencies or governmental agencies, I will say this, you know, whether we're frustrated or not with pg and I'll tell you that Mark Van Gorder and um, Jim Wickham on this call um, have been my go-tos for the last three or four years. Um, I talk to them on weekends. They are available. As a matter of fact, I, I had a conversation. Um, Mark was at a funeral over the weekend and we had a discussion uh, about things. And so I appreciate you know, their work. They're not the ultimate decision makers, but they are absolutely um, great cohorts and um, partners for us in the town um, and they champion our cause. And so that's why they're on this call. It's not to make a pitch to you. It's because this is who we work for, work with and, and who we're doing the, you know, the battles with. We're, we're working closely with them. So I really appreciate that. And then Mark touched on in the Rule 28 money and the funding sources. This study that we uh, will take to council for approval to start will cover those funding options for the town of Corte Madera. And, you know, we may have to be creative too, but we will cover all of these funding opportunities and any partners to coordinate with moving forward. And we'll work closely with Mark too on that, on that draft report just to make sure we're not missing anything. Uh, because as he said, things are constantly changing with technology. So Todd, just to clarify, like, is that draft report sort of a prerequisite to being able to apply for the rule 20? It's not, it's not. But, you know, for right now, as an example, I think the town of Corte Madera has about 300 and something thousand dollars in, you know, rule 28 monies. Well, that's not sufficient right now to do much of anything. And so what we're going to do is we're going to do an analysis, break in our high risk areas, understand what those costs are understand if there's any, you know, pg is constantly um, trying new technology and efforts. Maybe there are ways to save monies to try some things on the hillsides 
uh, but to understand what those costs are and as well as the funding opportunities. And I think that is important because then we can take that to the council, back to the community to say, hey, look, in our three most high risk areas, here's what the respective costs are, we think. Now, what are the options to be creative and what is the cost actually gonna be? And how are we gonna fund it creatively if we decide we want to do something like that? Keep in mind when we have that information now, it's a factual document. It's all your funding sources being proactive and creative. It shows the cost, it shows any opportunities. And then now, as you see, we'll go to the fire science, we'll go to our fire team and we'll say, okay, here it is, is there anything, you know, you have, you know, we talked about it, we have $20 million over a certain period of time. How, how can we best spend our monies and make us the safest? And we can have a, a thoughtful conversation because right now, you know, we think we know, but we, we don't have, we're missing a piece of just information of this conversation. And so um, we think we need that and we'll come back, you know, prop, this study hopefully is, is approved in March. I believe the council supports that. And then again, it'll take three to six months for that report to be completed. And we'll bring that back uh, later in the year to the community and the council. Great, thanks. Um, circling back around to some of the earlier comments, um, there were some concerns, obviously Christmas Tree Hill is steep, narrow. There's some one way roads and there was concern about evacuation routes and yeah, the interaction with the potential for undergrounding in those areas. Um, when could the undergrounding happen and also the ability of residents to evacuate if it was needed. Um, RJ, I don't know, like we spent some time in the last workshop talking about kind of the evaluation of the transportation network itself and some potential enhancements. So I don't know if it's worth reiterating some of that or if we, you know, tie back into the undergrounding conversation yeah, piece. I was going to touch, there was another question about how is the criteria in the plan um, or what was the evaluation criteria for some of the strategies in the plan? And um, so really, I wanted to touch on some of the, the obvious things. So, you know, town maintains the roadway network. Um, we have a responsibility on the flood control network side. And so those are very kind of clear cut responsibilities that the town has. And so that's initially, you know, where we spent our, our kind of brain power and efforts to analyze, you know, how can we improve our roadway network? You know, which ones are narrow that, you know, really serve a lot of people, especially in, in times of evacuation and, and should we prioritize those? and you know, put funds to make them wider because that's a very um, clear and obvious part of the town network is that um, responsibility for roadways. Um, so we've identified those and, and that's been a, a kind of large part of our strategies. Um, doesn't mean that we can't look at, you know, these other tools that, um, you know, whether it be the study for undergrounding, but um, that one's just less obvious. Um, you know, the town doesn't maintain electrical facilities. Um, but that's why we're here to partner with pg e and we're here to partner with Centrum and Fire to find out how to collectively um, move those forward and, and do what makes sense. Um, but yeah, we, we've looked at, you know, there's only one, you know, one way in and out of by vehicles for, for Christmas Tree Hill. And so, you know, we've identified some possibilities, you know, maybe it's um, improving one of the, the fire roads for either um, emergency access or potentially civilian access or um, maybe there's some other connections. So that's kind of where we've spent our, our time and efforts through the, through the um, climate adaptation plan um, by the town. Excellent. It looks like we have another resident who would like to speak and create a comment. So let's create some space to do that. And then we can circle back around. There's some comments about the plan at the adaptation plan itself. Okay, um, I will call on Colin Woodall. Uh, Colin, can you unmute yourself, please? Hi, so um, I know a lot of you have probably heard about uh, our issues at the top of Summit before, because I've spoken on this issue a few times. Um, please know that I have the greatest respect for our fire department and our police department and all of the people that um, govern the town. I have had uh, family members that were firefighters. Um, I just wanna give you a perception of what we have lived with at the top of Summit. We have dual power lines outside of our windows and they have come down twice. They came down with high winds 
that took down healthy live trees, not dead ones. Um, and there has been no maintenance by PG about that 20 foot radius that one of the images that you had on this meeting displayed. Um, the other thing is PG&E doesn't come up routinely and perform maintenance on our trees. We currently have two bay trees that are growing into power lines right now. Um, I can't tell you the last time that they were trimmed down to a height that prevented them from growing up within a year's time frame. Um, I also want to point out there's a lot of people that keep referring back to Coffee Park and the fact that they have undergrounding there. Um, and that didn't start the fire and they still burned. I want to point out that PG&E wouldn't have any reason to cut off our power if they didn't believe that the transmission lines weren't problematic or that the distribution lines weren't problematic. Um, as far as defensible space, I have a neighbor next to me that's probably 30 feet away. So creating defensible space around my house is not going to do a whole lot of good when my neighbors don't create defensible space. Um, I also have a property across from us that has been tagged as a serious issue that um, no one has followed through or enforced the fact that they need to create their own defensible space. And that's literally 10 feet away from my front door. Um, I've had the police department of Corte Madera tell me that on red flag warning days, that if I see anybody go up to the top of the hill after hours when they're not supposed to be up there, that I should call and report those people and that they would make that trip up. I did that on an occasion in December when there was a red flag warning. Those people spent nearly two hours at the top and the police department did not respond. Um, so as far as- Time, the, time has expired. Um, if you could wrap up your comments, please. Yeah, so as far as the fire department response time, realistically, there is no way that any of you can make it up here in five minutes because it takes me five minutes in my car and the last time the power lines came down, it took at least 15 minutes for the fire department to respond. Thank you. Thank you for those comments. Um, is there someone who would like to touch on any of that as far as you know, the challenges of vegetation management or you know, we talked brief, we talked in, about some enforcement earlier and how there is additional funding to make more of that happen now. <laughs> I can touch on the, de the defensible space. Um, well, yeah, feel free to um, reach out to us and give us address numbers for specific um, vegetation hazards. Um, and what we referred back to is trying to deal with each individual homeowner. Some are easier than others. Others are a little more challenging and take more time. Um, and that's where, where Measure C can come in and assist with some voluntary abatements and because that's what it's designed for. Um, if the goal for the fire department isn't to abate every single property, if that's the case, we become weed wardens. Um, it's, you know, um, or we're writing tickets for someone having um, a certain type of vegetation. Our goal is to educate the homeowners and have the homeowners take responsibility to protect themselves and um, their neighbors when it comes to defensible space. The fire department can't come and cut your vegetation for you every year. Um, and so I, I understand the frustrations. I get it, I'm a homeowner as well. And it's frustrating when my neighbors don't do it. Um, I engage with them and started at the neighbor level. Um, but if you're not getting anywhere with your neighbors, feel free to reach out to us and we'll go inspect the property and give recommendations on what needs to happen. Sometimes it's perceived risk versus a reality risk. And sometimes we'll go out there and we may work with a homeowner and come up with an overall plan that may take one or two years to complete their overall defensible space. Um, you know, and I can add a comment on as well too. We, we do get occasionally phone calls <clears throat> um, or requests from whether it's public works, um, or residents directly. Uh, I want to just reiterate our number, which is 800-743-5002. I apologize. I, I, I thought I knew how to put things into the chat here, but I, I apparently don't. <laughs> so...
uh, I'm not sure how to how to add in some of these links, but <clears throat> the number again is 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 800 743 5002. And um, for just about anything, if you if if you feel that there's a hazardous situation, something that you're concerned about, whether or not it's gas or electric, <clears throat> um, and uh, please please uh, let us know. Um, I'm seeing uh, the, I'm seeing something pop up here that says we've reported this and no one responds. If you're not getting a response uh, or no one's coming out to take a look, uh, then then uh, you know, if you want to let um, RJ know or, or the city manager um, I, you know, or, or uh, contact myself, you know, I, uh, I don't deal with billing issues. Uh, I, you know, there's a lot of things that I have to stay in my wheelhouse on, but I am here to try and help. Um, again, somebody mentioned that I don't connect or contact the mayor. Uh, I, I just, while we were, I saw that up there and I just sent a, a note off to the mayor and said, let's connect. I, I, um, I'm available very much as, uh, as manager Cusimano mentioned, and I'm, and I'm happy to try and help out wherever I can. So if there's trees that you think are a threat to our power lines, my ask is first call that number write down the date and time that you called that number and, 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 set, and ask for somebody to come take a look out. And, you know, if a week or two weeks has passed by and no one's responded back, uh, you know, I will, uh, I will ask that maybe you let RJ or, or Todd know, and I will find someone to come double check and see if there's something we can do. Um, so hopefully that answers those two questions. Can I add something to, to that, please? Um, so again, yeah, absolutely. I think when you call, um, you know, one eight hundred line or whatever, and, and there's always a frustration. Um, we don't get a call back. You can always contact staff. We'll always facilitate that conversation. I am concerned what I heard at the top of the hill. I'm not familiar with that. A, a line coming down due to the winds twice in the last few years, and so staff may be aware of that. And you know, tomorrow let's have a conversation about that and engage um, the last caller, and, and you know, make sure that. We're doing the things we need to do. I'm just going to be uh, completely blunt. You know, if you go back two decades, us as residents and as a town have completely failed in this area. We did not use our resources or we did not have the resources to do the things that we should be doing. And we've been playing catch up. And so going back three years ago before Measure C, we passed our sales measure F and, and our sales tax measure. And what that allowed us to do is really spend about $300,000 annually to start to educate to hire a code enforcement officer, only one, um, and then to start the vegetation management work with all the chipper work that we've done over the last few years, taking the vegetation off the, the hillside, just to get caught up for 10 years, 20 years of lack of maintenance, lack of enforcement of the ordinance. You know, so when we, when we consolidated fire services, one of the things that allowed us to do, it allowed us to bring in experts before we shared a dual role. You know, we would have um, our experts, they would be completing like three different roles, which they weren't efficient at any of them. Now we have Ruben Martin, we have Todd Lando, we have a really good staff. We have funding now with Measure C and Measure F to, to really catch up. We have three, we're, we're moving to hopefully three code enforcement officers to help with enforcement when that is necessary to help our fire folks in Corte Madera. Um, we're playing catch up, we're not there yet, but we, I heard your comments loud and clear, we all did. You know, a lot of people are like, don't don't put in this document what you're doing now. Well, yeah, absolutely. We are. You know, we have a 20 million dollar revenue stream. It's allowing us to do the things that we haven't done before. We're just instituting, you know, what we really should have had in place all along. But we didn't have community support or we didn't have the right infrastructure within the town. We have that now. We recognize it. We own it and we're taking advantage of it. Um, but the work is just beginning. And so the last piece is working for Central Run uh, Police Authority. I'll tell you, uh, for 22 years, going up that hillside is one of the most treacherous things um, a public safety officer can do trying to get up the hill quickly um, when you need us. And so your comments are absolutely correct. And if there's anything wrong on that hillside, you're not getting up it. And so one of the things within this plan, and, and RJ has been working on it, when we have opportunities on those turns, to widen a roadway, it is absolutely critical to do that so we can get our fire engines up there and our police 
uh, personnel. And so there's a lot of work for that hillside um, and we're gonna have, just have to be creative. Um, but it sounds like for me, just, I look up, I consider myself a bystander, listening to our fire experts and really being impressed with you. Um, I gotta tell you guys, you know, very rarely do I sit back and not feel like I have to say something, but when you guys talk, I just sit back and listen and I appreciate you. And I also appreciate our residents because we're lucky to have you. Um, I, when we put our heads together and problem solve issues, there's nothing we can't accomplish. Uh, it's just not a buzz statement. I mean it. Um, and I think we're going to make some progress. And I think this, you know, we call it a plan. It's a, it's a menu of options. It's, it's important, but it's really a long-term kind of document for us to, to really problem solve the issues facing us. So um, just thank you everyone for being patient. This mode of communication, uh, I hate it. I think we all do. I'd love to be in a room with all of you and just spend hours and just face to face and, and, and do the work that we need to do. And so, you know, I, I'm sorry, you know, but as soon as we can have face to face contact, we will do that. Um, remember too, we have our community chats every off Tuesday at four o'clock. Um, outside of the, every off week of the council meetings. Please look on our website. Please sign up for our newsletter. Please engage us during the community chats. You have all of your department heads and you have the mayor on the call. You know, we can, um, as we move forward, we may just have a dedicated to one department, the fire department or, or whatever we need to do to continue the conversations just within your neighborhoods. Because a lot of this I'm hearing is important to climate adaptation. But a lot of it is just face to face, being able to pick up a phone, ask for assistance and get the help you need like right away. And so um, I we have some work to do, but thank you for your comments. Thanks Todd for that. I do just wanna reflect back. We are getting close to our time. Um, I'm happy to stay longer if we need it. Um, there were a number of comments on the plan and the relative importance of that felt like attention that was given to the hillside versus the shoreline. Um, I can commit to working with RJ and the town to look at that as we refine and update the plan moving forward. Um, I can also say that the comments about the challenge of climate change are really real. You know, these risks that we're facing both in the hillside and in the shoreline are different than they were decades ago because of the changing climate conditions as well as additional stressors and you know, this innovative approach to bringing departments, bringing agencies together to really not only understand those risks, but come up with those creative solutions. It does take everybody and it takes the community and the residents who live on those hills, who know the issues, working with, you know, the subject matter experts and the town as a whole in order to implement those solutions that will make a difference. And as you said, it's a roadmap and it doesn't get implemented over overnight or over the course of a year, but you know, working together, we can chip away at that project and build the resilience of the community. There are some specific comments. Um, I don't see other hands up, but there are some like, you know, targeted comments and, you know, there's a, an appreciation for everyone who's been involved in all these questions that are coming in. There's, you know, if we want to touch on a few more comments, we can, or if Todd or Ruben, if we want to circle back to where we started. Uh, yeah, it's, um, as fire and emergency managers, we understand the risk of Christmas Tree Hill. It keeps me up at night. Anytime the wind blows, I'm awake all night because I you know, that's one of our biggest target hazards. We understand it. We're hearing you. And as a fire agency, I can guarantee that we are doing everything we possibly can. And we'll do everything possibly can to try to keep your community as safe as we possibly, as possible. Um, I will look, turn it over to Todd to see if he wants to close with anything else on that end. You're on mute. Oh, Todd, you're muted. We're saying something really smart too. I can yeah, tell. Yeah, you, I can tell. I have no idea what you meant. <laughs> You're on a roll. I, I, I would like to, to just uh, you know tie something into the climate adaptation plan. I, I think I, it re really if we look at tax measure C and and the the last five years or the last thirty years of wildfires in California and the West. Uh, we're tackling the wildfire issue nose on right now. We really are. The, the Community Wildfire Protection Plan, which is a state-of-the-art document we developed in 2015 
at, ad, adopted in 2017 before the North Bay fires is one of the best science-based uh, plans of its kind in the nation. Uh, we've just updated it. We're taking action from that plan actively right now with the, with the uh, uh, best developed budget of any county, any communities in the state of California right now. No, there's no other county that has a program like the uh, Marin Wildfire Prevention Authority. Uh, it's forward thinking. It continues a hundred year trend of Marin County being forward thinking as we approach and deal with wildfires from the Tamalpais Forest Fire District in 1917. The Fire Safe Marin was the first organization of its kind in the nation. This, uh, this tax measure is the first of its kind. So, so we're, we're dealing with these issues right now and the Climate Adaptation Plan recognizes that, that a lot of the, the adaptation measures, the mitigation measures that need to be undertaken are already underway. Uh, we're not done, but, but, but we've already started it and we've already developed the funding mechanism to make these things happen over the next decade. Um, so, uh, you know, at the end of 10 years, our county is gonna be measurably safer than it is today. Uh, we're not going to be free of wildfires by any means. Wildfires are just part of California, our, our vegetation, our landscape, and our climate. But, but we're going to be measurably safer than we are today. So we're, we're, we're tackling this right now. Uh, uh, that the, 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 if it looks like there are inequities in that climate adaptation plan, I think you've got the right team to evaluate that and make sure that it's balanced and, and approached right. But we feel very comfortable from the fire service perspective that our concerns related to climate adaptation and wildfires are addressed in that document and certainly in the, the other plans and, and uh, uh, you know, measures that we're undertaking right now. So. Uh, I just, I feel like I don't have any concerns on that measure. My concern is that we continue moving forward uh, aggressively to tackle all of these issues and, and we, we don't delay and we're not delaying. Great, well, I um, just wanna say thank you everyone who participated and wanna um, be respectful of everyone's time. We're coming up on nine o'clock. So um, again, we, uh, we're taking all the comments. We'll be revising the, the climate adaptation plan draft document, um, and, and we'll be incorporating, um, you know, much of these great comments we received here in the last uh, month plus. So thank you very much for all your um, hard work on on shedding some light on some of those items. And RJ, just one other thing, because I, I, I just see a theme, and I. I... I think it, cause it is complicated for those of us that aren't, you know, experts or specialists in the field. And I do see the, the, the first one is the equity conversation. Well, that, that's a continued conversation over the next, you know, 15 years. And, and that's the one document that we are going to deliver to council. It's a 15 year revenue stream for capital improvement, infrastructure protection and projects. And so that's the guiding principle of as we can think about our plan for the next 15 years, we look at how much money we have available and how are we going to spend it to make sure it's equitable throughout the community and also our biggest priorities. And so I'm happy to continue that conversation, um, Matthew and others. Um, let's keep talking about it. And then the other one on the fire side, uh, Todd and Ruben, it's how do we evaluate risk and what metrics do we use if you know now, hey, I have $20 million available to me on an X amount on an annual basis based on the current fire risk. How do you look at that? How do you evaluate it? How do you prioritize it? Um, you know, it's just for us, it takes a lot of education and catching up. And so I do think we could use some of our community chats um, some engagement with the, this neighborhood to kind of start to talk about that. So when we do get to the, the decision making process at the end of the year with the budget or whatever, you know, we're moving together. We're all speaking kind of the same language, um, I think would be helpful. But I think tonight is a great, great start to that. Yeah, I agree with you, Todd. And I want to thank everyone in the community for participating tonight. Thank you for your uh, comments. Um, they're definitely um, welcomed. And we'll definitely uh, put that plan together that you mentioned, Todd. And so that way at the community chat, we can um, basically uh, let the, explain to the community what we're doing at the fireside. Thanks everyone. Be safe. Thank you. Thanks everyone.